Coming to America was an idea Eddie had on a yellow pad. And it came from real life dating frustration. You know, people knowing who you are and therefore the perception already exists and it would be nice to meet a woman who doesn't know who you are and what you have. And that's where the concept came from. I want a woman that's going to arouse my intellect as well as my loins. Where will you find such a woman? In America. And his idea was essentially Cinderella. Halt! It was an African prince comes to Queens to look for his bride. That was the pitch. He pitched it to Paramount and they turned it down. What do you know from funny, you bastard? And so I remember him saying, if I come to America and I'm the people I meet in America, I bet they'll do this. Uh. Hey, it's Kunta Kinte! <laughs> I'd always been fascinated with doing characters and makeups and stuff like that. I remember young watching Planet of the Apes movies and the Hunchback in Notre Dame. And, and I thought coming from Saturday Night Live and doing stand-up, the type of stand-up that I did was so much with characters. It's like, how about if I'm all of these different people? And how about if we're some people they don't even realize it, who we are? I'm Eddie Murphy. I am the young black movie star of Paramount Pictures. She's still here. I went to Eddie and I said, Eddie, I want you to play an old Jew in this. And Eddie said, what? I said, I want, you're a young black man, I want you to play an old Jew. Because I know you can do the accent. And he said, hello, look, <laughs> you know, look at me. And I said, well, you know, I've worked with Rick Baker a lot, and Rick Baker's brilliant, and I think we can do it. I said to the studio, please pay for a test. Who was your star in that picture? Uh, this young guy uh, named Eddie, Eddie Murphy, I think. Oh, Christ, I hate him. <laughs> the kid with the filthy mouth. Yeah, he's the one. Oh, he's the voice. <laughs> he's the voice. He can't act. He has a filthy mouth. And he's ugly. Eddie went out in the studio, started flirting with secretaries and just being this outrageous guy. This is beautiful. What is that, velvet? And when I brought him in front of Ned Tannen, the head of the studio, and I said, Ned, I'd like you to meet Saul. And Ned's looking at me like, Hello, you know, why are we here? I said, uh, Eddie, tell him who you are. And then Eddie started talking as Eddie, and I'll never forget it. I mean, Ned just, I mean, it was one of these moments. It was like, you know. Oh, my goodness, it is you! Coming to America, it was real work. He ain't lying. I mean, you get up at midnight and get to the set, and you sit. There are days you have straws in your nose so you can breathe while they do something to you. It's a tough business. I hope you don't mind me coming over and sitting down. But I've been watching you all evening. And I want to tear you apart. And your friend, too. Arsenio then, you know, wanted to get in the act. And then he was one of the barbers. And then Eddie's old friend, Clint, he played the other barber. And so there were these three young black guys playing three old black guys. And... It was really fun. I mean, I, I have to say that they really got into it, and Eddie really got into it. And I think the makeup freed him in an interesting way. Pound for pound, Sugar Ray Robinson, the greatest fighter ever lived. Oh, come on, man. What about Joe Lewis? The blonde bomber. Now that was a great boxer. You damn right. I remember one of the most popular critics around when that movie came out. He gave it a bad review, and he said, it's a scene in a barbershop where Murphy and Hall are supposed to be playing multiple characters, but it gets so confusing, you don't know who they're playing, if they're playing anyone at all. Well, then you're a punch. And I remember thinking, wow, we did such a good job. You can't even tell who. That's a guy would think that that would be something that you would applaud. They were saying, yeah, it's a Lewis badge. You can't tell what's going on. It's confusing. And all that. But that scene resonated with me. And also the scene with sexual chocolate. That guy is singing on <laughs> stuff. If I fail, if I succeed, you can't take away my dignity. Because the great ass. Love of all inside of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sexy chocolate. That boy is good. Mm -hmm. Good and terrible. And it came out and it did very, very well. And, and what was nice was that it was a big hit all over the world and no one ever thought of it as a black movie. Yeah, I was always going, I'd hear people say, the most successful black film of all time. And it would say, like, uh, 
waiting to exhale in one of those movies, and I'd be like, oh, coming to America, three times the grosses, and it, it, it always people have to dawn. I'm like, yeah, that is an all-black cast. Like, the whole cast is black. A country like Japan, which is an important market, there was never a film with a black actor in the lead that made money in Japan. Coming to America was the first movie to star an African-American. It was a huge hit in Japan. Huge hit all over the world. I will cherish this experience for the rest of my life. He's so gifted and powerful. He can get a movie made like that. Where did you get the idea for Harlem Nights? Uh, my accountant came to me and he said, you know, you almost have no more money left. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> We're doing this next week. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Eddie first talking about Harlem Nights, the era, the clothes, doing something with Richard was a huge motivation. Yeah, I thought it was a hip idea back then. I was like, me, Richard, and Red Fox, uh, three generations of comedy, black comedy, and it was like, hey, let's get us all on screen together. Did you apologize to her yet for shooting her in the foot? Hey, Shug, I thought the whole thing was supposed to be, you know, forgotten about. I don't know if she said that, but I think she still was a little hurt. She still is. I know she don't show it much, but deep down inside, she's a sweet old woman. Benny, why'd you put this orange juice in the refrigerator with just a swallow left in the container? Well, swallow it and shut the up. You blind You fat bitch. You should go talk to her and tell her you're sorry. Oh, fat bitch. Every day we just laugh. In fact, that we should have shot the stuff behind the scenes and put that on the screen. <laughs> be the nine toe having this limping. <laughs> <laughs> keep rolling, keep rolling. No rolling. <laughs> I <got it. laughs> Ironically, it also ended up the project where Eddie did everything, including cater the lunch breaks. He wrote, he directed, he starred. What was it like directing, man? Right? It wasn't as much fun as I thought it was going to be. And because uh, it's a lot of stuff that they ask you like that, you're like, do you want this cushion like this or like this? And you're like, I don't care about the cushions. <laughs> but I don't like stuff like that. But I might do it. Depends on how successful a movie is. If the movie comes out and it's successful and people are going, oh, it's wonderful, I'll direct again. If they go, ha, that was garbage, I'll never do it again. It was really intense because that was the first time I had done a movie that wasn't really successful. And it was like, ah, he finally screwed up. And he's an egomaniac and he's out of control. Uh, you're really depressed and got fat. Oh, yeah, I remember them ripping the movie, and I remember for years after Harlem Nights, maybe four or five years after Harlem Nights, I wouldn't even watch it. Quick! <laughs> I'm gonna kill you, quick! <laughs> then I started seeing it on cable, and I was like, hey, this movie's funny. <laughs> So I'm glad I did it.